thank you for this presentation and for asking these questions. Uh, Jonathan, the last speaker, maybe has the answer to these questions. Please. Yeah, it's a blue screen of life, sorry. <laughs> so I come from the perspective that the internet is absurd. It works in practice, but not in theory. We're still trying to figure out not only how it works so well, but how it happened to become the worldwide global facility that it is. Desiree scheduled this event on a particular date, the 10th anniversary of something that's really more lore than it is written down in any book or academic paper. In order to provoke some of my co-panelists, I'm going to tell that story as best I know it, subject to their clear corrections, to give you a sense of just how absurd the net is. If we were sitting down today to design a network or redesign a network intended for a global audience, it would look nothing like what we have. And just to give you a few of the waypoints that convinced me of the absurdity of it. Suppose you wanted to get a letter, or metaphorically then speaking, a packet from the podium to the back of the room. The most obvious way to do it would be to have a letter carrier, employee of the Royal Mail, be paid a small vig, a fee, to carry the letter from here back to Bill. That would be far too easy, far too centralized. You need a whole infrastructure for that. The internet answer to this question is, why not actually make every potential recipient of a letter also a carrier of it? So if I want to get somebody to the back of the room, I can actually just get it as far as Becky. And then she passes it behind her, and he passes it to him, he passes it to him, and eventually it gets back to Bill. Pretty amazing stuff. The basis of so-called best efforts routing. That's right, best efforts otherwise known as send it and pray, <laughs> or every packet an adventure. <laughs> this is not how you're supposed to design a network, and yet that's how the internet works, along so many dimensions, going for the simple, low resource intensive, non-centralized answer to a problem for which it would not be our first guess if we were not ourselves internet engineers. And that's why I've been told that if the People who design the protocols were to have a mascot, it would be this, the bumblebee, because it is said that the bumblebee can't really fly. If you look at the specifications for a bee, its fur to wingspan ratio is far too large, and it just won't get off the ground. And yet, the bee flies. IBM is known to have said as late as 1992 that you couldn't possibly build a corporate network using internet protocols. And yet, the bee flies. I was very much gratified last year in January when it turns out scientists have finally figured out how bees fly. I know I don't have a whole lot of time, I'll just tell you that they flap their wings very quickly. <laughs> so the organization that makes this stuff work, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, sounds a little bit like I don't know, the counterterrorism unit or something, right? Chloe, it's Jack. I need an internet engineer immediately. <laughs> Unincorporated. No place to sue them. No president. No elections. Their motto? We reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. These are the lunatics that have brought us the internet. <laughs> you say you want to participate in the efforts of the IETF? Here's their screen. It's not a membership organization. No cards, no dues, no secret handshakes. Smiley face. <laughs> These are the people that brought us the internet. That because they reject voting in a room full of people who are arguing about internet protocols, they call for a hum. And they go on the basis of the hum as to whether or not consensus has been reached. If I want to distill their principles, these are what I'd say they are. Keep it simple. Keep it open because growth could come from anywhere. Let the right idea win. This is not a democracy. And the killer twin assumptions that people are reasonable and people are nice. Do we need some database to maintain identity on the net so that the first prompt you see when you enter the internet is user ID and password? 
right? That's the obvious thing to do. It's what CompuServe, AOL, Minitel, every other network did. No, because we already have a database of who the users are. It's a distributed database among all the users. Because what user would ever lie about who he or she was or be mistaken? Don't recreate what you already have among your users. And as wisdom accrues through those hums and discussions on IETF mailing lists, let's record them in RFCs. That's right, requests for comment. Nearly 40 years ago was the first RFC one. And then they just numbered them sequentially. So here is uh, RFC number 2555, 30 years of RFCs. It's an RFC about RFCs. Mm -hmm. And it tells you how this facility meant to be so tentative. It's only an RFC, that is to say, a request for comment. And then you give me comments, and then I'll put out a new RFC, request for comment. This author, Steve Crocker, says, mindful that our group was informal, juniored, and unchartered, I wanted to emphasize these notes were the beginning of a dialogue and not an assertion of control. They're only an RFC. Until someday, it becomes a final RFC, <laughs> at which point that's the standard. It's a final request for comment that is not, in fact, a request for comment. So in the DNS space, we have one of the pioneers here, Paul Makapetris. <clears throat> Sadly, somebody who can't be here is John Postel, also known as the IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, because it seemed a little weird to be like, I need some addresses, I have to call John, right? So let me call IANA on the speed dial, and I reach John. <laughs> this is, of course, a picture of him from around uh, 1995, meant to make him out to be the god of the DNS. This is a more accurate picture of him in Geneva with the um, trademark sandals as well. Somebody running a system that wears sandals and that, as his principles, does not include it'd be awfully nice if I made some money is a strange person, is a threat to a system that, as it suddenly goes mainstream, wow, there's money at stake, there's calculable rules needed, you can't be so ad hoc, and I'm not so sure about these RFCs. So as the DNS around 1984 starts to get the basic hierarchy to it, to which we have become accustomed, in the next 10 years, you start to see problems coming about. I don't know how many people know of Stanley Kaplan. They'll help prepare you to get into college on something other than your innate abilities. <laughs> Princeton Review is a competitor. Princeton Review registered Kaplan.com at a time when domain names were still free for the registration. That's right, you could have as many as you wanted for free. But if you asked for too many, the people on the other end would be like, that's too many, do you really need all these names? Why don't you ask for fewer? When Kaplan found out that Kaplan.com had been registered by Princeton Review, they were not pleased. And they called up Princeton Review. Princeton Review offered to settle it for a case of beer. Kaplan sued them instead. They won the lawsuit, resulting in one of my favorite quotes in all, quotes in all of internet governance. <laughs> Kaplan has no sense of humor, no vision, and no beer. <laughs> this, of course, is the tip of the iceberg of problems that beset a system meant for an academic, non-commercial environment that suddenly hits the big time. We start charging for the names. Why? It's said that John Postel likes to do a job until it gets boring. And once it's boring, he wants somebody else to do it. So he goes back to the National Science Foundation that had been funding him here and there and said, find somebody else to run .com. There's too many names in it. The experiment's going too well. Network Solutions steps forward and says, we'd be delighted to run <laughs> this. And ultimately says, you know, instead of getting government money to do it, cash and carry, we live in an era of cost recovery. Why don't we rent these names out at, oh, I don't know, $35 a year, two year minimum, eh? That's National Science Foundation says, fine, whatever. And you have the basis of the entire domain name financial system established in that casual of a way. So you start to get the kinds of pressure I'm describing here. Dennis mentioned ISO 3166. Oh, yes, ISO 3166, of course. How did that come about? Because at some point, somebody didn't want to register in .com, a friend of John's, and said, you know, over here, this is a pretty big island. Can we have .uk? John says, I don't see why not. He changes the root zone, boom, there's .uk. 
And then other people in countries start stepping forward like, hey, the Swiss need one too. Now, John doesn't like to do boring things, but he also doesn't like to engage in foreign policy. There's got to be a happy medium between the two. So he says, I need a list. Give me a list of countries so I know what's a country and what's not. And I don't have to decide about the Palestinians or Pitcairn Island, the mutiny on the Bounty Island. Is that a country or not? And preferably, two-letter abbreviations for them as well, so that Paraguay and Panama don't fight over the lucrative .pa domain. So he finds the International Standards Organization, the group that tells us how wide the flange on a plug should be so we can have vacuum cleaners work in localized areas without having to interchange stuff. ISO has a list, 3166, countries and two-letter abbreviations for them. And John says, boom, that's it. And whoosh, there's a whole group of new top-level domains for each country, including for countries who never asked for them. What was John's rule? There, he would run them in trust or have his friends run them in trust for that country until the day the country steps forward and says how they want to run their own TLD. Kind of like on Star Trek. It's like the Federation watches the planet until it discovers warp drive. And then it comes in and it's like, hello, you're not alone, right? <laughs> .us was run in trust for the United States government, waiting for it to discover warp drive until what, 2002? And then, what did the US do when it discovered it? Put it out to the highest bidder. It is the United States, after all. So when these problems come up about fighting over new names, knowing that there could now be millions of dollars at stake, what does John do? Well, he can't just act unilaterally. He knows that's going to lead to trouble. He tries to negotiate a little bit, but this is a tough one. So that's right, it's been mentioned. He forms the IAHC, the Internet International Ad Hoc Committee. Right, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Who wants to be a member of the Ad Hoc Committee to determine the future of the Internet? Well, let's just get the rest of the alphabet soup. There's ISOC, the Internet Society, whose president is here. IANA, that is to say John. The Internet Architecture Board, which is to say the IETF people, the Federal Networking Council, the ITU, the trademark and intellectual property people. Let's just sit down and settle this all, and I'll give you a seat on the committee and see what we can do. What did they come up with around 1996, 97? That's right, the GTLDMOU, the Global Top Level Domain Memorandum of Understanding that anybody can sign. You all can still, if you like, as a reward for attending today, sign the GTLDMOU. And what was the idea behind the GTLD MOU? Well, it'll be a series of rules going forward as to how we'll break these log jams on trademark ownership, on adding new top level domains. How will we know when it's ready to roll, when this will be the answer? I guess when there are enough signatures. John will just say, I guess it's soup. Now, as I understand it, he got ready to say it was soup. And the GTLD MOU called for some top-level domains to instantly be added the moment that it was soup, which is to say the root zone would be edited to add that. Who controlled the root zone? Well, that's an interesting question, because John was understood to be the guy that actually directed when to put something in or out of the root. So when Zaire falls, Mobutu flees, and it becomes the People's Democratic Republic of the Congo, the people at the ISO change list number 3166. No more Zimbabwe, new Congo, ZR is gone, CD takes its place. It's John who says to the root zone operators, okay, it's time to add .cd and take out .zr. Very wise people immediately registered jazz.cd and music.cd, <laughs> and they were especially hopeful that Mobutu would not come back. <laughs> but because it had been boring to run the root, Running the route had been tucked under the activities of Network Solutions Incorporated in Herndon, Virginia. Also running .com, hey, it's just like a 100-line file. Would you mind also maintaining the A-list master route? And NSI said, no problem. Just tell us when you want stuff in or out. John is alerted by NSI that if he wants to do this GTLD MOU crap, don't come to NSI because they will refuse to add those initial names from the GTLD MOU to the root because they don't think it's soup yet. They think .com has enough room for everybody. That's the moment, 10 years ago to this day, that John had been engaging in a series of tests to see whether the other root servers pictured here 
might be willing, instead of all tuning into the A root server in Herndon, Virginia, to maybe tune into his lonely little B and L root servers in Marina del Rey, where he held his academic post. He arranged for half of them to try it, just directing there, and he would tell them the same answers that they'd get from NSF, uh, from the NSI server, so there'd be no difference to an internet user. But boy, did NSI notice the difference. As I understand it, they called the FBI. Someone's trying to hack the internet, and he's wearing sandals. <laughs> what happened next, I will let others here who know the history and lived the history, I will implore them to tell the story within this room, and it's only being webcast, so you've got complete <laughs> privacy. But the upshot of it all was that the U.S. government stepped in with some adult supervision and said, this is lunacy. It's time for everybody to calm down. It's time for a white paper. So they issue a white paper, a statement of policy from the Department of Commerce. How's that for a thunderous ring from the heavens? A statement of policy from the Department of Commerce that said that the internet grassroots should find a way for a new IANA, a new organization that will settle all these problems. And by the way, you have until September of 1998 to do it, ready, go. Thus was created the IFWP, the International Forum on the White Paper. Where did it come from? I'm still not entirely sure. Where was its first meeting? Herndon, Virginia. Hmm. So it's through a series of events like this, negotiations, politicking, dealing, threats, that by the fall of 1998, roughly there stepped forward one and a half entities to claim the mantle of the new IANA. The half was a group of people who were coming to the Berkman Center at Harvard for a meeting to sort it all out. Uh, that meeting was canceled after most of the primary participants pulled out, but they had non-refundable tickets. So they showed up in Boston anyway and made their own bylaws. Ira Magaziner at Commerce said to the new IANA, which was soon to be named ICANN, talk with those Boston people, figure it out. That led to the section of the ICANN bylaws that was just titled Membership, TBD. We were promised a membership, which came about and then was abolished. So what does ICANN look like? It's got all sorts of organization in its chart in order to plug in all the different stakeholders. Here is a critic of ICANN saying this is how it really looks. I think this is its most recent organizational chart. But ICANN was meant to be the answer to the problem. What do you do as your success becomes catastrophic, as the informal bumblebee of a system that you designed gets so wildly popular? And can it survive its own success? Now, there are others waiting in the wings to help if ICANN can't manage the job. Here's the International Telecommunications Union, founded in the late 19th century to regulate encryption use on telegraph. The ITU has countries as its members, so it's democratic. It's through that democratic process that the ITU assigns country codes for international dialing so that the United States is one and Ecuador is 593. <laughs> the ITU has said it's time for a focus group on next generation networks. That's right, we need a Fagininginin. <laughs> so here's the Nigin that they've suggested, the ITU's Nigin. As you can see, simplicity is at its core. What I like most about this is, if I may just point out, here's the internet. <laughs> right? The internet will plug in to this monstrosity. What are the features you get for all this stuff? Oh, I'm glad you asked. There's bullet point after bullet point of features for the ITU figanigigan. What are the differences from the internet we have today? They're actually quite few. They want broadband capabilities with end-to-end -end quality of service. None of this best effort stuff. I want to get my video to you instantly and be able to pay enough to know it's going to get there. And on its second list, compliant with all regulatory requirements, for example, concerning emergency communications and security privacy. Exactly the stuff that Paul snuck into his last slide for 2008, saying, oh, and here are all the other things that might be good to have and that are on people's minds. That's what we don't have on the net of today because we're still living in the world where the whimsy, the craziness of it 
is what prevails and is what allows two guys from Northern Europe to invent Kazaa and upend the music industry. And when they're done, they're like, what should we do next? Oh, let's take on the telephone industry. Here's <laughs> Skype, right? And we can all download it and run it with no filters. That's both what we stand to lose and potentially what we stand to gain in terms of regulability if you are hurt by this chaos as we look forward to the next 10 or 20 years of development at this point of inflection as we try to figure out just how informal or formal we can be. Thank you.